So why don't I go ahead and ask everybody to grab their seat, and we're going to start in traditional academic time, so a few minutes uh, of leisure here. Um, let me begin by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Adam Stolberg, and I'm on faculty at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs uh, here at Georgia Tech. I'm also uh, the co-director of the school's policy research arm, and I also have the distinct uh, privilege of being the uh, next chair, uh, following in the footsteps of our, our current chair, uh, Joe Bankoff, who is sitting over here uh, on the margins. Um, so it is really my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here today uh, on behalf of our school, as well as Georgia Tech, and if they'll permit me, uh, GTRI. Uh, and I do want to thank our, our colleagues here at GTRI, the Georgia Tech Research Institute, for uh, allowing us to, to host this event here in this great uh, venue. As you know, the topic uh, of today's uh, program uh, really looks at the nexus between emerging technologies uh, and terror or terrorism. Um, and we're looking at this topic at both what I would call a propitious and inauspicious moment, a paradoxical time, if you will, of this nexus. On the one hand, obviously, it's very timely, uh, given the broad-based awakening uh, to the complex intersection uh, between various emerging technologies, uh, such as uh, AI or um, drones, cyber, uh, the CBRN domains uh, that are the focal points of this conference that uh, are beginning to show signs of, uh, emerge, uh, of uh, strategic effects. Um, that are having undisputable impacts uh, on societies uh, and state behavior. And as a result, there's been a, a really a, a, a renaissance of attention on issues related to dual use and the emergence of seemingly uh, ubiquitous technologies and their impacts uh, on defense strategies and statecraft uh, that really seem to be de rigueur these days uh, for the study, for strategic studies and uh, the study of international relations. Um, and this diffusion of, internet, of emerging technologies not only uh, provides us with vexing challenges that, to distinguish between offensive and defensive, a commercial or military application, but the very diffusion and interdependencies of these technologies uh, and their widespread applications. Uh, empower a host of non-state actors um, and create new ecosystems uh, of that empowerment as well as vulnerabilities that we need to be thinking about. Uh, so as a result, I think the international community uh, writ large, defense communities, national security communities, and those scholars of international relations are in search of new strategies uh, that cut across different emerging technology domains to contend with the various asymmetries, disruptive, uh, the asymmetrical issues, the disruptive issues, and the transformational issues uh, presented by these emerging technologies. Um, and moreover, uh, this interface uh, between emerging technologies and non-state actors presents us with an especially uh, wicked problem in the sense that we've time-honored debated who are terrorists, uh, what do they want, what are their capacities, why are they strategically significant. Compounding that problem now are what are emerging technologies, you know, their contending views about what the technologies themselves are and what trajectories they're on, how accessible they are uh, to different types of players, and what are the strategic effects. So this is a particularly wicked challenge uh, that is the topic of today's uh, uh, conference. So in many ways, as I mentioned, this is real, this is, we're really at the precipice of a halcyon moment, uh, if you will, for this intersection. On the other hand, I would argue that this is a particularly challenging time for looking at this interface. Uh, one only has to look at some of the national security documents that are coming out of the United States, but really writ large, uh, we seem to find ourselves back to the future, uh, uh, focusing increasingly on great power conflict. Uh, where, yes, everybody's uh, focusing on emerging technologies, but it's really how those technologies uh, play out in the hands of rivals such as China, uh, the US, and Russia in particular. Uh, the impact of these technologies on strategic stability, on offense-defense balances, security dilemmas, how these actors may or may not use proxies, under which conditions for various strategic effects. 
So there seems to be a gravitational pull back to the future and looking at uh, great power conflict. And it's in that context that I would argue that we really owe a debt of gratitude uh, to the organizers of our event today. Uh, because they are really getting us back to focus on this emerging challenge of these technology uh, uh, terrorist uh, interfaces. And so I'm particularly pleased to be able to welcome you all today uh, on this topic, especially when we've been able to, uh, with, our, with the hosts uh, and organizers, bring together such a, a great community, if you will, of scholars not only of technology, and not only of terrorism, and not only of strategy, but of all three, and, and talking about those uh, together. Okay, you're obviously not here to, to listen to me, uh, but rather uh, to uh, get, the, get on with the show. And to do that, I would really like to introduce uh, the real drivers and the intellectual heft uh, beyond, behind uh, today's event. Uh, and we're very fortunate uh, today to really be able to highlight um, an intersection between two campuses uh, that literally are next door to each other. But I think I've read about terrorist, ideological terrorist organizations in the 1970s that cooperated better than uh, our institutions. So I think we uh, uh, have, we really do owe a debt of thanks to these uh, organizers. So let me identify uh, our two colleagues from across the way and then two of my own colleagues. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Mia Bloom, and I really don't need to give her much of an introduction because I think she's well known to everyone, but uh, she currently is a professor of communication and Middle East studies at Georgia State. Uh, she's the author of many different novel uh, works on uh, looking at some of the drivers and consequences of uh, global terrorism. Uh, her book, uh, Dying to Kill, is well known. Uh, her more recent book on small arms and children in terror is also uh, really uh, screaming off the charts. Uh, but Mia, most recently, she has many different positions. I'm not going to read them all. But one of her more uh, recent positions, which I would like to bring to everybody's attention, is that she is now um, editing a series at Stanford University Press on terrorism. So hopefully some of these ideas uh, that we're going to talk about today will find their ways uh, into the pages of her uh, August series. Uh, we are very fortunate that she has a partner in arms from across the way as well, and Dr. Yannick Villou Lepage. Uh, he currently is a senior researcher in the Transcultural Conflict and Violence Initiative at Georgia State. Uh, and here he works on a number of DOD uh, funded projects, uh, which in and of itself is a challenge as well as a great opportunity. Um, and so we're very glad that he too has really brought his intellectual might uh, to the, today's event. Um, and of course, uh, closer to home here in the Sam Nunn School, we have uh, Dr. Jenna Jordan, and I see a number of students out there, and she is well known to all of you. Uh, she is currently an associate professor in the Nunn School, uh, and she brings tremendous expertise on international terrorism. She has a new book uh, that's going to be hitting the streets very soon on uh, uh, a, a very uh, pleasant topic of decapitation uh, as a strategy, but she looks at a, a range of other uh, different strategies for contending with different forms of international terrorism. Uh, and her colleague in, in arms here and in, in, uh, hosting this uh, conference is uh, also my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Rubin. And Larry also brings a lot of expertise in international security and nonproliferation across different technologies. Uh, and of course, area expertise in the Middle East. Uh, Larry has written a number of uh, works on uh, international terrorism. He is uh, work with me on topics related to strategic stability, and he too is on a part of an editing uh, team uh, uh, for a journal in the related uh, field. So I can't think of four better people to, to uh, organize and provide, again, the intellectual heft uh, for this event. And, uh, but so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mia, uh, who will tell you a little bit more about the substance of today. Uh, but again, on behalf of the Sam Nunn School of International Relations, I want to thank you. And for those of you who are coming from out of town, I want you to really appreciate that Atlanta is really emerging as a one-stop shop, if you will, and a hub for understanding issues related to technology and international security, state or non-state based, uh, because we have a great community, not just here on campus at Georgia Tech, uh, where we do a lot of the technical inter interaction and as, as well as some of the social science work, but also at Georgia uh, Tech's Research Institute, where we do a lot of the applied 
uh, research and of course uh, our colleagues across the way at Georgia State. So this is a great place to come and I look forward to seeing many more of you over the, over the following years. So Mia? I want to thank everyone for spending the day or part of the day with us today. Um, the idea of the conference came about because uh, I've always uh, been appreciative of Georgia Tech, the Sam Nunn School in particular, of Senator Nunn, uh, Mrs. Nunn, and so I was honored to come to the Nunn Forum a few years ago, and I thought, you know, we really should be collaborating more, and it's a wonderful opportunity to bring together the expertise. If you actually looked at Atlanta between um, the people that you've heard about at Georgia Tech and Georgia State, and then people like Austin Doctor over at UGA, we probably in Atlanta have more terrorism experts than any city other outside of DC. So we have some real strengths here. Um, I have to do the disclaimer because uh, the Minerva Research Initiative, uh, who has partially funded and sponsored this conference, has been very generous uh, to the, the to all of the participants, and so. Basically, neither I nor anyone else on the stage today will be representing to the Minerva Research Initiative, the Department of Defense, or the Office of Naval Research, and so any and all mistakes that we make are our own. Uh, that said, I want to encourage people to tweet. Our hashtag is hashtag T2T, the number two conference. For uh, Wi-Fi, it's APR with the password Atlanta Braves, uh, capital A, capital B. Please, please tweet, help us disseminate some of the great research that the participants at the conference are doing. Let me just very briefly tell you where Minerva comes from, aside from being the name of the goddess of wisdom. In 2008, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert Gates, um, up, awarded $50 million to the DOD to disseminate for the purposes of social, cultural, behavioral, and political forces shaping the world. The idea was, to help research in a variety and a consortium of universities to promote specific research that was relevant to the DOD and US national security. And so it was also both theoretically um, to move the science forward as well as to improve the ability of the DOD to develop cutting edge social science research. And I think that that's what we're doing today. I think today we're gonna be able to move the science forward to be able to talk both about the theoretical implications of the research that's being done, as well as the transitions and to the applied elements. So I just want to thank everyone again. I also want to add in to the thank yous that um, Adam mentioned, uh, both to Marilu and Carissa and all of the Georgia Tech uh, grad students who've helped out. And so we expect it to be a great day. Um, we've added to the schedule, it's not formally on your agenda, but there will be uh, Georgia Tech bookstore is coming. There will be Like War, uh, books sold by um, both uh, uh, Emerson Brooking and Peter Singer. They will be here to sign the books, as well as I am seeing for the first time ever Small Arms, so this is my launch, so thank you. So my book on children and terrorism. And then Jim Walsh's book on drones. So you will have the opportunity if you want to get any books, have the book signed or personalized. I, I used to joke that they make great Christmas gifts, but they're very depressing. So thank you again for coming. And we hope that, again, ask questions, be curious, push the boundaries, and please tweet. Thank you very much. Perfect. I'd like to invite the panelists for the first panel to come up to the stage. So drones have, have traditionally been the purview of states. However, as early as 1994, non-state actors have sought to weaponize them with the death cult Umshram Rikyo looking at the use of remote control helicopters to uh, decimate sarin agent. In recent years, we've seen how Hamas, Hezbollah, the Islamic State, and more recently, Houthi rebels have sought to weaponize states and create a drone program which rivals that of state actors. To touch on the question of drones and their potential terrorist use and many other uh, aspects of this question, we have first uh, Jim Walsh at the University of North uh, Carolina, Charlotte. 
followed by Sarah Kreps at Cornell University and Eric Lynn Greensburg at Columbia University. Now, without further ado, I'll open the panel with Professor Walsh. Thank you. Oh, mine is queued up. Sure. So, sure. Okay. All right. And we'll start with Sarah. Thank Follow you. Me. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the conference organizers. Uh, when Mia Bloom sends you an email inviting you to anything, you always say yes uh, because she puts on a good show and brings the intellectual heft. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, also, uh, it's spring here, and when I got on the plane in Madison yesterday, it was snowing. So, so many, it's overdetermined that it's a pleasure to be here. So I wanted to, we were uh, talking before the panel about kind of the order and what we were each talking about and kind of decided that my comments were much, or sort of the general overview, and so it might provide a, a, a set of framing comments uh, for the other two speakers. Uh, so what I wanted to do with these remarks is talk a little bit about, uh, you guys are all sort of engineering tech-based, so I can use things like concept demo. Um, so basically the US, United States had uh, demonstrated the concept of the use of drones for counterterrorism. The Israelis had used this to some degree. Uh, but so much of the uh, use of drones in the last two decades has been by the United States. So there's the most data, there's the most debate. And so I wanted to start there a little bit, kind of thinking about the trends, what has happened in the United States context, uh, some of the arguments, the debates that surround that by way of thinking a little bit about what that says about other countries, uh, and then turning to what I think is really kind of the new frontier on, uh, on drones in the context of terrorism, and that is non-state actors, and then to countermeasures. And this, this is, I think, one of the most nettlesome questions surrounding the use of drones by non-state actors, which is that they are uh, hard to defend against. And then I'll conclude. So drones, just conceptually, <clears throat> unmanned recoverable system that carries a payload, so not uh, a missile that is non-recoverable, any size, any shape, need not be armed. What I think is really interesting about where drones have gone in the last uh, five years or so is that we used to think in terms of armed and unarmed drones. So these are examples of armed drones. Uh, the Chinese have an entire industry that is uh, that, that what, they control about 70% of the civilian drone market, but they have entered into the uh, armed exports, um, and they're doing that quite well. Uh, here's the U.S. Reaper, uh, and so we used to think of these in very segregated ways. Here are the unarmed drones. You can see kind of the variety here. One thing that I think is interesting, and again, this ties to this question of this new frontier, is that these lines are becoming blurrier. So now you can take one of these smaller, previously unarmed drones and make it lethal. And I think that is, in, again, why this makes this next frontier so difficult to kind of wrap our head, heads around, why it is also a huge market for industry to come up with solutions. So what do we know about the US context? Again, kind of thinking through where have we gone with this? Uh, what's interesting about this, if you can not look more than a nanosecond and realize that when the United States started doing this in 2002, uh, there was a long hiatus. There, this was not sort of the go-to tool in the counterterrorism toolkit. Uh, this increase at the end of the Bush administration and then within the first year or two of the Obama administration, there were more strikes than in the entire Bush administration. Uh, one other thing that I think emerges from this uh, graph is the kind of geographic wave that this has, that these trends have followed. So this really started as a kind of um, frontier, uh, the Fatah in, in the northwest part of Pakistan. Uh, those have gone basically to zero. Uh, then it shifted to Yemen. That was, uh, for whatever reason, pink in this graph. Um, and now this has shifted again to Somalia. So I was talking to people at the Council on Foreign Relations the other day who uh, they were writing an explainer on the use of drones in uh, Somalia. And, and what's interesting about this is there's been so little attention on the use of drones here. And you can see that that's sort of, a, you know, in, in, in IR, Adam and I were talking about this before, you look to the real world for puzzles. This is kind of puzzling. There are a lot of drone strikes in Somalia and no one talks about it. And I think part of it is the degree to which this has really become kind of a normalized practice in U.S. counterterrorism policy. 
So this is not without controversy. So in 2003, Jay Carney said that drones, uh, we use them because they're legal, they're ethical, and they're wise. And this has really, I think, sort of been the, the main defense of drones for counterterrorism. Uh, so let's unpack this a little bit, and I'll try to do it briefly. So what, the, the legal defense of this is that if you want to point to international law, there the UN Charter says that Article 51 allows for anticipatory self-defense. Uh, Harold Coe, who is the legal advisor to the State Department, said in 2010 that the principle of distinction and proportionality are not just recited at meetings, that the United States thinks a lot about this. Uh, and then in terms of domestic legality, the authorization for the use of military force from September 2001. And that seems to be still kind of the implicit legal, domestic legal rationalization for uh, counterterrorism strikes, for example, in Somalia. So what about the ethics? Well, there's one set, this is a sort of set of arguments that if you're going to use force, this is the least bad way to do it. You don't want the Pakistani army in there. Uh, you don't want uh, necessarily the, 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 the fledgling Somali army. Um, it's more humane than ground forces. It's less threatening, less risky for manned aircraft. Uh, drones are great in the sense that they can loiter over targets for a long period of time and call off a strike at the last minute. So for those of you who've seen Eye in the Sky, uh, this is a really, uh, it's actually one of the better kind of popular uh, uh, media, whatever uh, film Hollywood takes on this, where you see the drone that is flying 24 hours a day, look at doing surveillance of the target, and then, uh, well, then they have the difficult question of whether to pull the, I won't spoil it. Uh, but it gets at kind of the degree to which these drones can actually do really good ISR and try to minimize civilian casualties. And then the question of wisdom, and this is, this is sort of a strategic wisdom. President Obama has had said repeatedly that we need to kill the people who are trying to kill us. Uh, and so even people who have been critical of this say, well, yes, even in, it's true that in the short term, drones do kill, kind of have tactical advantages. Um, and there's real political, domestic political wisdom. And I think this sort of gets to this puzzle of, of, uh, of, of why if there are strategic costs, which Jenna, I think, has written about quite convincingly, and I'll get to this in a second, why do we continue to do it? And I think there are good political reasons that also get at this question of the fact that we have uh, dozens of strikes in Somalia this year that no one talks about, which is that these allow political leaders to fly below the radar, pardon the pun. Uh, they don't, no one's writing uh, vociferous letters to members of Congress. They can kind of do this without uh, impunity. Um, and I think a really good case of this is the Niger attack on the soft forces, where four uh, members of the military are killed. Um, Se uh, Senator Graham said, you know, gee, I didn't even know we had 5,000 troops there. Uh, so, and he's armed services, right? So these, be, he should, of anyone, be in the uh, awareness business. Uh, and then right after that, there's a the deployment of armed drones, and now we have this uh, fledgling base in Niger. Um, so what are the counter arguments? And I wanna go through this a little bit faster. So the AUMF, um, this is John Belliger, who was a legal advisor in the Bush administration. He said that they, this is long in the teeth. So this is now uh, going, it's in its 18th year. Uh, the interesting thing about the AUMF is that it, it, said it authorized the president to, to use force against Al Qaeda and its associated forces who planned 9-11. So it's really an interesting question of whether a group like Al-Shabaab is an associated force when uh, it was not in existence on 9-11. <coughs> president Obama himself frequently urged that the AUMF be revised. And so I think there are good sort of legal questions on this front. Uh, the ethical question, I think, is, uh, is also germane here. So there's a moral hazard problem, which is sort of if you have this hammer, everything might start to look like a nail. And I think there, this, I think, is less of a concern now than it was before. Uh, I think in 2010, when a lot of this con controversy started coming up, there very much was, and then this is something that Obama talked a lot about in 2016 as he was leaving office, which is, you know, this technology just made it too easy and too tempting to use force. And so he talked about how, you know, you end up with a president, it's like third party, you end up with a president who engages in perpetual wars all over the world. Lack of agency. So what about the wisdom? And this, again, this is uh, Jenna's great work on the question of decapitation and martyrdom effects. So are you actually creating more terrorists than you're killing? And I think there are good arguments to suggest that that, that might be 
uh, the case. So then why the continued use? And I think this gets to some of these sort of principles of democratic accountability or lack thereof, which is political elites have short time horizons. They're risk averse. They want to get reelected. They don't want controversy. And so you can take the short term counterterrorism gains and let your successor do deal with some of these longer term strategic losses. Again, I think it's no surprise or no coincidence that it was the fall of 2016 where Obama does all this soul searching about whether this was the appropriate policy to be taking. So let me turn now to the non-state actors. And this is, I think, really interesting. So I think the US has actually improved uh, its civilian ca casualties on counterterrorism uh, strikes are close to zero. Um, non-state actors ha can neutralize these disadvantages. They don't play by the same rules. They don't have to worry about and as many of, sort of the, the legal and ethical questions that uh, have, I think, constrained the United States. Um, and, and in that sense, I think, there are huge advantages, and that's why I think this is really kind of the next frontier. So drones have also been referred to as flying IEDs. Um, those who spend time in uh, serving in Iraq know that this was a huge problem. Uh, the US spent billions of dollars uh, countering something that these guys were making in the uh, garages of their uh, uh, places in Iraq. Uh, so we have this huge asymmetric advantage of IEDs. Now these are flying IEDs. Uh, so they create even more advantages. So if you think about kind of all of the um, obstruction to vehicle-borne IEDs, you can just get around that. You can just circumvent that. You, you just fly it over. And this speaks uh, also to some of uh, Mia's pr uh, work on suicide terrorism. Um, think of what a, sort of the strategic logic of suicide terrorism is that you want to maximize the casualties. So the uh, disadvantage of a um, non-flying IED is that you might be sort of rolling the dice on whether you're going to, this is going to go off at the right time. The flying IED, you can kind of do your own sort of visual surveillance, fly it into a crowded area, and then detonate. So you have a strategic advantage is they're extremely inexpensive. So if you really want to go all out, you could spend $5,000. Uh, if you want a rudimentary one, it's it's a thousand dollars. So how much is the U.S. spending on its technology? It's orders of magnitude more than that. Um, so they circumvent the physical security barriers. They're too small for radar systems, and there are infinite numbers of small uh, of soft targets. So Diane Feinstein said these are the perfect assassination weapon. Um, the FBI director said it's a steadily escalating threat by non-states, and you can see why. There are just huge advantages. Um, so these are just some examples uh, of those that have been used. Uh, they range in <clears throat> the degree of sophistication. This is one of the early ones on the upper right. You can see that that was, again, extremely rudimentary. But there's, just like how we evolve in our technologies, they're evolving in their, in their technologies too. So these just keep improving. Uh, so again, though, it's amazing that you can just take one of those, those uh, you know, the payloads are still small. So, so uh, Gary was talking last night about working in the, the maker space and developing drones that you can put half a pound on. So a half pound isn't going to kill this entire room of people, but you don't need to, to have the effect, the psychological effect <laughs> of uh, whether in a civilian setting or a battlefield setting of killing a couple of soldiers. Um, and so those improvements keep being made. And here's sort of the political domain, which again, I think is, is, uh, is interesting in the sense that if you think about, so this is uh, Angela Merkel who looks amused. Uh, I think this is really before a lot of the stuff hit the fan on um, Brexit. Uh, so, um, but, but you, so this looks amusing, but just imagine now that this is equipped with a, a small explosive. And you don't have to imagine that, because that's what happened in Venezuela. Um, and so how does a country counteract that? Uh, here is one. This is actually one of the mm, interesting ones. So these guys in fin uh, Finland, I, I can relate to this because I live in an Arctic uh, place like this in upstate New York. Uh, so there's not a lot to do in, in, in the winter. So these guys came up with um, <laughs> this. Yeah, it's a, you, you can't like anthropomorphize the snowman. Uh, but basically, they decapitated the snowman with this chainsaw that they attached to the drone uh, and then filmed it and then got a lot of uh, YouTube hits. Um, and so, but you know, 
it's, in some, some senses comical, but in other senses, you can see how this can be sort of the sky is, the, again, bad pun, the sky is the limit in terms of how these can be used. And again, what I think is the, uh, the really uh, sort of taxing thing about this is the detection mechanisms. Um, and why this is such a tricky issue. Uh, and so there's no perfect sense, of, no perfect detec detection. Maybe some of you will be working on that or think about how you do that. But if you think about what an uh, a anti air defense system is intending to do, you have to find that sweet spot so you're not picking up every um, chemistry student spinning his pen that looks like. <laughs> A target, right? Um, or, uh, so you have to make it small enough that you're detecting these kinds of systems, but big enough that you're not picking up everything. And so you're not getting the false positives or the false negatives. Uh, so the, getting the sensor sen sensitivity right. So they're trying to train these eagles to bring down drones. Um, I can imagine also the the, the PETA, the, the, the animal rights people will get on this eventually, because you can imagine that that might detonate into the eagle also, which wouldn't be a good outcome. Um, and then these nets, the nets that they're trying to come up with, but this is also sort of what do you do in, uh, a, a, in, in terms of sort of these infinite soft targets? Are you just gonna put nets around every single stadium that we have? It, it, it strikes me as a, 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 a certainly um, infinite sort of uh, problem in terms of how to counteract this. Um, and then we haven't even talked about the swarms. That's something that Gary is working on as well. Um, and that's a sort of slightly different problem. I'm, I'm not convinced that the, uh, the non-state actors are going to be able to get kind of the systems engineering on this right. Uh, but it's something also to kind of keep on our uh, radar. So just to conclude, uh, so this, I think the US has shown that this is, uh, can be an effective tool of counterterrorism, but it's not without controversy. And I think where the non-state actors come into this, though, is that they basically get all the upside and none of the downside. They're inexpensive, infinite numbers of soft targets, and they're pretty hard to defend against. So I think this is really kind of the next thing that we need to be thinking about in terms of counterterrorism. Um, and dealing with those tricky issues of how to counter uh, those developments. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to my colleague here. I'm back, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to build on uh, what Sarah talked about in terms of the sort of general context and technological capability of drone technology and think about how militant groups that are targeted by these weapons by the United States are likely to respond uh, in terms of political violence. Uh, my key point is, is that they're unlikely to be entirely passive acti actors, right? They're likely to adapt uh, to this new technology that threatens them. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how that might happen, how the technology links to their adaptation. Um, and so, Stepping back for a second, combat drones are this sort of suite of technologies that are designed to address what political scientists call the identification problem in counterinsurgency. And the identification problem, simply put, is that um, insurgents or militants frequently try to disguise their identity, right, uh, by, by dressing like and blending in with civilians. So for the counterinsurgent, uh, the, the, one of the key challenges, arguably the key challenge, is distinguishing or identifying the militants uh, from civilians. And drone technology should enable this in a number of ways. First, uh, it, because the pilots are remote, there's no onboard crew. Uh, this means that uh, losing a drone is less politically and militarily costly, right? So you can use these, um, use these drones in combat areas that are basically riskier for ground troops, right? Places like uh, um, northwestern Pakistan or Somalia or Yemen, where for political and military reasons, you would prefer not to introduce ground troops. So you can take the fight to new places at a lower cost. Um, they also have these advanced ISR capabilities, right? Uh, so that they can collect multiple streams of intelligence. Uh, they can also loiter for long periods, right? So they can monitor a location uh, and decide to strike uh, when the time is right, that is when they have sort of solved the identification problem so that they know that only militants are in the safe house and no civilians are nearby, for example. Um, and then the armaments that they are equipped with, uh, preci precision guided munitions, uh, help address this problem as well, right? So they're really designed as a um, sort of the perfect counter militant or counter insurgent uh, weapon. 
And in fact, if you look at the data that uh, I collected for, or we collected for this paper, uh, now this is data, for, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, but this is data from drone strikes in Pakistan. And we can see that most of the victims of drone strikes are actually militants, right? Uh, uh, over 2,000 of the victims have been militants, whereas fewer than 1,000 are civilians, and about 50 have been leaders. Uh, and so I, I wanted to put this up because many of the arguments against drones really focus on the consequences of especially killing civilians and leaders. And I really want to focus in the talk today on what are the consequences of killing militants, which is what these uh, weapons are designed to, designed to do, right? But very briefly, one of the criticisms of drone strikes is that uh, they do kill civilians, right? And that the civilians, uh, civilian deaths, civilian kills can create a backlash against the United States, right? Uh, they give the, uh, create grievances among the civilian population uh, against the United States. They provide militants with narratives of US br brutality and fundamentally could drive some civilians uh, to support the militants. Uh, another angle has been uh, looking at um, kills of militant leaders, right? And the argument here, one of the arguments here is, is that this will uh, weaken the cohesion of the militant organization and lead lower level combatants to shift their violence to sort of softer targets, right? So it could actually lead in an, to an increase in terrorism. But fundamentally, the, the, no one has really explored how killing large numbers of militants influences the, the organization's behaviors. And so that's sort of the topic I want to take up. So uh, if you're a, a militant organization, one of the key challenges you face is human resources, right? How do you persuade people to join your organization or to otherwise support your organization when the risks of doing so are very high, right? And the benefits are often uh, not, don't often accrue solely to the members, right? So if you wanna change the political regime in a country, if that's your objective, maybe many people would benefit from that, but it creates sort of a collective action problem for, for militants. And, and we suggest in this paper uh, that the ability of drone technology to better address the identification problem really directly threatens the ability of militant organizations to manage their human resources in an effective way, right? Uh, the threat of uh, being killed in a drone strike should maybe leave uh, current militants to leave the organization or move away from it and dissuade other people from joining the organization. So in the paper, we argue that the militants are likely to respond to this challenge uh, to their ability to manage their human resources, uh, their ability to really recruit and retain militants by engaging in more terrorist attacks against soft targets in urban areas. So let me, let me flesh this uh, argument out a little bit. Uh, so one challenge that drone strikes create is they might create the impression that the targeted militant group is weak or weakening, right? Uh, drone strikes get a relatively large amount of attention, uh, media attention, um, even though they're supposed to be secret, that's you know, really not the case. Uh, so this publicity can undermine the messaging of the militant group that they are really a viable organization. So one way to counter that is uh, to engage in violence after a drone strike. That would help uh, demonstrate to current and future recruits that the militant organization remains viable, remains in existence, uh, is resilient in the face of this violence. So our sort of first more general expectation is that we expect to see militant violence uh, shortly after drone strikes, right? And, and the shortly part is important there because uh, if you can mount a, a terrorist attack or some other form of political violence immediately after the drone strike, it can more effectively counter the message that your group is weakening. Uh, we also suggest that um, these concerns about recruitment and retention that are created by drone strikes also, also influence the type and location of violence that militants are going to employ. And so here we could think about sort of two general classes of targets of militant violence. One is against military targets, military or political targets, right? Uh, like military bases or con convoys of military forces and things like that. Uh, these are sort of maybe have many advantages for militant groups because they really bring the fight to their, their most immediate enemy, uh, but they also expose rank and file militants to greater risk, right? They're at greater risk when they attack a military target uh, when, than they are if they t attack a softer target. <clears throat> so um, we suggest that the incentive to engage in these sort of attacks on military targets will decline when the militant organization is targeted by drones, right? Because this is a way to sort of uh, preserve their human resource base. 
and instead they're going to shift their violence uh, from, to what we call softer targets, right? And, and in the context of Pakistan, I'll talk about in a second, that largely involves terrorist attacks uh, and assassinations of political and government figures. And most of these attacks, we suggest, are going to take place in urban areas for kind of practical reasons, right? Uh, there are just simply more targets in urban areas for them to attack, more of these softer targets in urban areas for them to attack. Uh, it's more difficult for drones to target militants in urban areas, right? Uh, it's harder for them to, there, there's more basically cover for the militants in urban areas. And the risk of civilian casualties, which the United States has, of course, wanted to avoid, would increase the more people are nearby the target. Um, so this really places militants who are organizing and undertaking attacks in urban areas at less risk, less risk of harm uh, from drone strikes. And so our expectation is not only will we see uh, more militant violence immediately after drone strikes, but it will shift from attacks on military targets to attacks on softer targets in urban areas. And this will both signal that the militant organization remains viable, right, uh, um, can continue to fight, and also help preserve their, their base, their human resource base. So to investigate this, we look at uh, att drone consequences of drone strikes in Pakistan from 2006 to 2011. And we picked this period for a couple of reasons. One, as, as we Sarah, this is when drone strikes were really ramping up, right? It was really sort of the height of the drone campaign, especially in Pakistan. Um, and also, we have uh, quite good data on militant violence in Pakistan from a data set that allows us to measure two response variables I'll talk about. One is urban terrorism. So these are terrorist attacks and assassinations uh, that take place in urban areas in Pakistan, uh, plus uh, Islamabad. And then we also have data on military attacks, so a number of attacks per day on military and government targets throughout the country. Uh, so let me just talk briefly about uh, the, what, how you define an urban area. This is not so obvious. This, is, this figure shows the distribution of populations across districts, which are uh, third order administrative districts, which are basically urban areas uh, in Pakistan. And you can see that the, the, the population very large, it ranges from over 10 million to, to much lower levels, and creates the question of where, what, what, what is an urban area and what is not. So if I can go back one slide, um, we don't try to come up with a definitive answer of this, but we sort of test uh, this with data from um, the 5, 10, 15, and 20 most populous districts plus the, plus the capital, and get consistent results regardless of how we define urban areas. Uh, so our explanatory variables, we have three uh, sort of corresponding to some of the literature that I talked about earlier. We have the number of militants, uh, rank and file militants that are killed per day by drone strikes in Pakistan. Uh, we have the number of civilians killed per day and the number of leaders leaders of the militant organizations. And one interesting thing here is, is that all these deaths are, of course, the consequence, a consequence of drone strikes, uh, but the correlation between them is uh, kind of surprisingly low. Um, and then we include some, uh, some covariate variables, uh, uh, time periods when Pakistan was mounting military offenses in the country, um, some peace accords with militant groups, uh, and other things that might um, uh, promote political violence, like elections. And if we just sort of eyeball the data that we've collected here, this is the uh, a plot of militant kills, uh, which is sort of the variable that we're most interested in, and urban terrorist attacks during this time period between 2006 and late 2011 in Pakistan. And you know, eyeballing the data, looking at this casually, there seems to be a rather close correlation here, especially when you compare it to uh, civilian kills. So here is civilian kills are in orange and urban terrorism is in gray again and uh, leader kills. You'll notice that the, the axis on the left-hand side, of course, changes across these three because the number of militants killed per day uh, can be much higher than the number of civilians and leaders. And looking at this a little bit more formally, we uh, do some regression analysis. And here, our dependent variable, our response variable, is urban terrorism. And if I could just take a second to walk through this, uh, we lag um, the number of militants killed per day, the number of militants, leaders, and civilians uh, per day uh, into seven, 14, and 21 year periods, uh, 21 day periods, excuse me. Um, and what we see is that militant kills after 14 or 21 days have a positive relationship to urban terrorism, 
right? So it takes about a week for the militants to um, respond to a drone strike with increases in terrorism. And we don't see any such relationship for leader kills and civilian kills. Uh, they have no relationship to urban terrorism in our models. Uh, this is the su substantive effect. So the substantive effects here are, are rather modest. Of this, on the x-axis here, we have the number of militants that are killed per day in drone strikes, and then the predicted number of urban terrorist attacks in our, in our models. And then looking at uh, insurgent attacks, or that is attacks on military and government targets, we see again that leader kills and civilian kills don't have any consistent relationship with this form of militant violence. But after about 21 days, uh, the, we see a decline in uh, these sorts of attacks um, when militants are killed, right? So th this is sort of consistent with our idea. We see some shift in violence from attacks on military targets to attacks on softer targets and urban areas. Uh, so wrapping up, uh, we see in this paper that uh, killing militant leaders and civilians really doesn't have a very consistent relationship with any type of military militant violence. Uh, but drone strikes, which are really effective at targeting rank and file militants, they do seem to weaken the militant organizations. And the consequences of that are uh, fewer insurgent attacks, but also more terrorist attacks. Um, and, and one thing this suggests is, is that the shift in drone strike strategy around late 2008 from targeting really primarily leaders to a targeting rank and file militants, uh, that is in sort of drone speak, uh, shifting from personality to signature strikes, could have, could have generated these negative effects, right? That uh, expanding the target list to rank and file militants had the undesirable consequence of increasing terrorism Pakistan, in Pakistan. Uh, and that is undesirable for the United States. On the one hand, that maybe is not so, such a bad problem for the United States because those are terrorist attacks that are not happening in the United States or against US uh, targets, uh, but it could potentially destabilize the country in, in many ways. And I'll just close in mentioning that um, at least one important limitation of this paper is we really only focus on the short-term consequences of drone strikes, right? So really within about a month after a drone strike occurs, what happens in terms of militant violence? Um, it's possible, though, that over the longer run, uh, some of these effects could shift, right? So you could imagine perhaps that over the longer run, uh, killing of civilians would lead to an increase in civilian support for militant organizations, and maybe uh, perhaps killing leaders could um, more fundamentally degrade the organizations than we talk about here. So I will wrap up there. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, well, good morning, and, and thanks again to the organizers and to everyone else uh, for being here. So what I want to try to do over the next few minutes is to build upon uh, some of the work that Dr. Krebs and Dr. Walsh have done, but to turn the tables a little bit and to try to ex examine what happens when terrorists are the ones using drones against the United States and what that means in terms of public perceptions towards these terrorist groups and various policy preferences. So as Dr. Krebs mentioned, terrorist groups are increasingly using drones. Uh, they range from somewhat complex things like the, uh, the ISIS drone you see in the upper left-hand corner uh, to much more rudimentary objects, but to carry out kinetic military operations uh, throughout the Middle East. But it's not all that outlandish to think that terrorists might actually bring this type of weaponry to the United States. So within just a few years, uh, we had drones not necessarily operated by terrorist organizations and not necessarily with nefarious intent that found themselves perhaps in the wrong place at the wrong time causing a lot of panic, causing lockdowns, and tens of thousands of dollars being spent in terms of generating responses or grounding flights, right? So I think 2015, you saw a drone flying onto the White House property, and then just December of, of 2018, uh, Gatwick Airport was shut down twice because drones were spotted, right? And the military was mobilized, and so you see a, a lot of, of potential terrorist use cases. And we know that terrorist organizations hope to use this type of technology within the United States. So this is a glossy propaganda ad from ISIS, which was put out just after the Gatwick attacks, in which you see a commercial off-the-shelf drone carrying a private mailbox and flying over Manhattan Island, right? And you probably can't see it in too much detail, but uh, each of those smaller images are instances where ISIS has carried out attacks uh, against major population centers in the West. So we know ISIS wants to use this type of technology, but, you know, what effect does this have on a few things? The first is, how does the American public perceive groups that use this type of technology? How do they view the threat that these groups pose or don't pose? 
And then how does this shape their policy preferences towards things like the use of force against terrorist organizations or very intrusive intelligence monitoring, both here in the United States and abroad? So if you bear with me for the next 10 or 12 minutes, I'll try to convince you that terrorists that use drones are viewed as much more sophisticated than those that use suicide bombing attacks or, or conventional truck bombings. But surprisingly, they're not viewed as more threatening. They're not viewed as more effective at achieving their goals. And there's really no impact on their policy preference, uh, the policy preferences of Americans. And so there's some important implications that I think uh, arise from this, both from a policy standpoint and a theoretical one. So on the policy side of the House, as we'll discuss later, perhaps this shapes how we want to structure the narrative surrounding uh, terrorist organizations that use advanced technologies like drones. And then it also raises theoretical questions um, about the link between technology and threat perception. So let's dive into this a little bit more, right? So first, why do terrorists use drones? The first, as Dr. Krebs mentioned, is really to provide a degree of capability. So there's a lot of literature on terrorist innovation and also literature on why states develop new weapon systems or adapt. And they tell us that states do things because they want to have some kind of capability. Right? So you can imagine you have a tarp, but it's been hardened. Right? You have vehicle boundary or barriers, so you can't drive a truck bomb into it. And so you perhaps attack from a different dimension using a drone, which we've seen in the Middle East. Or you use drones to signal status, right? So there's been a lot of literature that says both state organizations and non-state actors want to signal some type of modernity. So on the left side of the slide, you have the Reaper, uh, an aircraft that's flown by the United States and several of our allies. And it's a system that I think has really become a symbol uh, of modern warfare. But what you've seen is terrorists who are using much more rudimentary drones have tried to capture this imagery. So what you see on the top left or right hand side of the page is actually a screenshot from an ISIS video where they've tried to create what looks like essentially a US drone, drone image, right, with crosshairs and things like that, that they put out uh, as part of their propaganda campaigns, right, to try to signal that they have some kind of capability uh, and status, right, that they are a modern type military actor. And then the third reason why states are using this is because these systems are just much, much easier to acquire now than they have been in the past. So there's been a democratization, really, of technology that used to be firmly in the hands of government uh, that now are openly available. So on the low end of things, you have systems like this. I can go into Amazon and, and buy a drone for $400 and then strap a grenade on, onto the bottom of it. Or on the higher end, you have states where Drones have been proliferated, and they're transferring these systems to their terrorist allies. So here you have a, an Iranian drone that was transferred to Hezbollah. A uh, drone similar to this uh, made several flights into Israeli airspace. And then you can imagine there's several ways in which a terrorist organization could actually use drones, right? So you could use it to carry ISR missions. You could use it for logistic reasons to, to carry goods back and forth. Or you can use it to carry out kinetic attacks. And I'll focus on that last type of use case, right, to carry out kinetic attacks. But I don't want to talk about kinetic attacks in the Middle East. I want to talk about kinetic attacks here on the US homeland or in the territory of our allies. And again, let's go back to these kind of three broad categories that we looked at earlier, right? The perception of the group, threat perceptions, and then policy preferences. And to do this, I use a survey experiment, right, which is this combination of a survey. So I'm presenting people with a scenario and then asking a battery of questions. But it's an experiment in that I'm manipulating uh, the, the scenario that the respondents are presented to. And I'll talk about that in detail in a second. So let's take you to the world uh, that the respondents were exposed to. They're told that there's a terrorist attack uh, in Times Square. Uh, the terrorist attack is carried out by a terrorist group based in Somalia that has the objective of punishing the United States uh, for carrying out military operations in Africa and the Middle East. And in this terrorist attack, 23 Americans are killed and 16 are wounded. But let's talk about the experimental manipulation. What I do is I, I vary, uh, well, the software program assigns people into one of three buckets. Right? So they're either told the attack was carried out by a suicide bomber, by a truck bomb, or by a drone attack. Everything else about uh, the scenarios is identical. Right? So the, the, the reason the group was carrying out the attack and uh, the number of personnel killed. And again, we're trying to find out how this shapes public policies and public preferences and perceptions towards these types of terrorist actions. So in terms of the perceptions of the group, I ask a battery of questions about how sophisticated respondents view this group, how effective they view this group as being, how able this group is to carry out repeated attacks of this sort. And then in threat perceptions, I ask straight out, well, how threatening is this group? And then I try to look at some of the underlying psychological features, right? So anger and fear, things that are often associated with driving threat perceptions. 
And then I ask a set of questions about policy preferences. So one is a question that says, how you know, willing are you to support uh, intelligence collection that's very, very intrusive, so kind of Patriot Act type collection uh, after these terrorist attacks? And then the second question deals with support for airstrikes. So what do we find? So let's put up a bunch of, uh, of tables really quickly and, and run through these, but let me kind of explain this. So the first question uh, that I ask respondents is, how technologically sophisticated or unsophisticated do you think this group is? And they rate this on a scale of one through five, from not very sophisticated at all to incredibly sophisticated. So along the horizontal axis, you see the three different treatments or the three types of attacks, so either a car bomb, a suicide bomb, or a drone attack. And this is the only question and the whole battery of questions that actually gets a significant response. Right? So people find that a group that uses drones to carry out an attack is viewed as much more technologically sophisticated than those that use a suicide bomber or a car bomb. But things get a little bit more muddy when we start looking down and other questions, right? So the next question I ask is about effectiveness. And what you see here is there's really no statistically significant effect. People view the group that carries out a drone attack as being largely just as effective at achieving the objectives of punishing the United States as those that use a car bomb and a suicide bomber. Same thing when it comes to effectiveness, right? There's, there's really no, no statistically significant effect of using a drone attack. And then when it comes to a threat of that, to US national security, again, you see no effect. And this is kind of surprising, right? We were told that people view these groups as being much more sophisticated when they use a drone, yet they don't view them as more threatening. So perhaps this raises some questions about how we conceive of threats to the United States and the homeland when carried out by different terrorist groups. And again, these underlying psychological features, so anger and fear, are not statistically significant. There's no difference between the, the type of attack that was carried out and the degree of anger or fear that you see. And then we turn to policy preferences. Right? So the first question says, after these attacks, the president announces a series of very intrusive intelligence collection approaches that are going to monitor both US citizens and foreign terrorists um, after this attack. And again, you see no difference, really, that's distinguishable among support for these intrusive mechanisms across each of these different treatment categories. And the same thing when it comes for calling for military action. So at the end of the day, what does this all mean for us, right? So as we started, I said, well, terrorist groups that carry out attacks with drones are viewed as more sophisticated, but nothing else really matters. So where does that leave us from kind of a, a policy standpoint and takeaway? So the big thing I think that's important is we need to shape the strategic narrative, right? You can imagine that a group that wants to characterize itself as being incredibly advanced and incredibly sophisticated is going to use that in terms of recruiting personnel, right? If you tell people, hey, I've got this really uh, advanced capability, you should join my group. Um, but if we can downplay the technological sophistication, perhaps that gives us a, a bit of an advantage in countering uh, terrorist recruitment. And then I think from a policy standpoint, we have to, to reconsider some of our academic theories of threat perception that are often tied to kind of capability um, and levels of fear and anger. Um, so where do we go next with this? Uh, so I'm planning on fielding this experiment on military personnel to see if military personnel hold similar views as members of the general public um, and to expand the treatments, right? So this is a really simple pilot that I've run uh, where I am only varying the type of attack, but other factors can also trigger fears and, and threat perceptions. So the number of casualties, high, low, and then also the, vary the terror group type. So in the experiments here, it's this random unnamed Somali terrorist group. But what happens if we say it's, it's a right-leaning or white supremacist group? Do the same types of results hold? And then also to look at you know, whether demographic characteristics shape uh, these positions. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, more conservative-leaning respondents are, are much more likely uh, across all of these conditions to view uh, the attack with anger, to view the attack with fear, and also to call for much more uh, escalatory responses. Um, so that's what I've got and uh, look forward to your questions and feedback. Perfect, thank you very much for a very insightful three presentation. Uh, we'll open up the floors for question in a few moments, and luckily we do have about 55 minutes left, uh, so very good timekeeping on everybody at hands, which is fantastic for an academic conference. Um, I'd like to start off by touching on one of the, the theme that I think came out of the three presentation, which is the psychological effects of drones. And I'd like to kind of push back a bit more on the question, does the, psychologic, does the psychological effects of, of, um, of drones outweigh the direct military effect? And how do you weigh those against each other when assessing the strategy and the effects of 
of various strikes. Did that question make any sense? I've taken a lot of cough medicine Wait, today. Question mark again. <laughs> so the pushback is that you took our comments to suggest that the psychological impact may be greater than. So the not, not necessarily a pushback. I'd just like you guys to expand a bit more on the psychological effect of drone vis a vis uh, the strategic impact that a drone strike might have, both talking about non state and state actors. Uh, okay, so, uh, right, thank you. So, I, we have not, some of this is sort of a theoretical anchoring because we haven't seen this sort of attack take place. And I wondered, uh, this sort of engages with Eric's experiment, this question of whether people can really wrap their heads around what this would mean because this hasn't happened yet. So, I've done cyber escalation experiments about some cyber attack that leads to uh, hundreds of casualties sort of downstream. And just people can't wrap their heads around that. And I think in part because they, that hasn't happened and it's very abstract to them. Um, but one of the things that I guess I draw on um, in part, which I think connects more to your work than, uh, than Jim's in the battlefield setting, uh, is something like the 2001 uh, it was 2001, right? The um, sniper attacks in DC. Or the anthrax attacks. So the total number of people killed was not that significant. But the degree to which people uh, changed their daily habits in response to this was astonishing. I mean, it's sort of this availability bias. Uh, I think there was a Brookings study that showed that the number of people that stopped flying after 9 11 and drove places instead, within a couple of days, the number of people who had died in car accidents was far more than the number of people who had died on 9-11. And so I think the psychology of national security is, is, is complicated, and that something like a drone attack uh, would possibly, just in its novelty, have sort of an outsized impact on how people think about their day to day. So if they suddenly, if there's a, a situation in a stadium, for example, uh, where two people are killed, or two people are uh, bloodied by an attack. Does that have an effect, a psychological effect, let's say even no one's killed, in terms of people staying away from these activities? And, and so uh, the psychology of it, I think, is difficult to sort of suss out anticipatorily, but I think we can draw on some of these experiences in the past to suggest that it might have an impact in ways that we can't necessarily agree. No, I think I agree with that. So I, I was really surprised when there was this null effect, right? And so got to thinking, I said, OK, well, when you think about things like the DC sniper incident, uh, you think about anthrax, there's a, a good deal of media framing that happens, right? And that's not tested in the experiment. Um, so I think you're right. If the media comes out and says, hey, this is something entirely new, uh, you, you bring drone experts, right, like, like yourselves that are now on CNN or something talking about this new type of, of terrorist attack. Um, I think that potentially drives up some of the psychological concerns that, that didn't get sussed out necessarily in, in relatively simple treatment. I can talk about a couple of uh, findings in other research that relate to this question. So one is, is that people's perceptions and preferences are not independent of the setting. In particular, drones are um, more accurate at uh, killing militants and, and kill fewer civilians, right? That expectation shapes people's um, evaluations of outcomes, right? So if you prime people to say that a drone strike occurred that uh, is likely to kill many civilians, or a military attack occurred that is likely to kill many, many civilians, and then you tell them that it does, they're not happy with that, but they're less unhappy than if you prime them with the expectation that, it, uh, that the attack is from a highly accurate drone, right? So the, the introduction of this new technology also creates new expectations and new constraints in terms of public opinion. Um, <clears throat> another, another finding from some related research is about moral hazard, right? So the cons one of the concerns here is that uh, and I think you maybe have mentioned this is, uh, in, in your talk, Sarah, right, is, is that by reducing the cost of conflict, in term, uh, particularly reducing the likelihood of U.S. military casualties, uh, people may be war more willing to endorse uh, the use of force in the form of drone strikes than they would other types of military action. Um, and, uh, and we find there's like, not really that much support for that, uh, particularly when you prime people with expectations about what are the alternatives to military force, right? If there are good or bad alternatives to military force, we find that when you tell people that there are um, 
good alternatives or possible reasonable alternatives to military force. Uh, they, they are much less likely to endorse the use of military force, which I think kind of runs counter to the moral hazard argument, which would lead us to expect that they would just endorse military force under really any settings when the, when the downsides seem quite minimal. Fantastic, and I'd like to, to abuse my prerogative as a chair to ask one more question before turning it off uh, to the audience, and that relates to, to a conversation we had a bit at dinner yesterday, which is a much more policy-oriented uh, orient, uh, question, but it has to do with the proliferation of military drone technology, but also commercial drone technology, and I was wondering, while not a question, I was wondering if you could speak about the policy implication of the proliferation of this military and non-military drone technology. Sure, so, so on the, the military proliferation side, right, and this is a, kind of a, a conversation, I think it happened a few times at dinner, um, the United States has long had a, a strong presumption of denial on the export of, of military drones, right, under the MTCR, um, but this has been kind of challenged in recent years because one of the logics is, well, if we don't sell it, someone else is, right, and as Dr. Krebs mentioned, uh, China is this, you know, rapidly growing uh, drone exporter. And when we export a, a military system, we're not only exporting the tool itself, but we're exporting essentially an entire training cycle uh, that lasts more than just training that one drone pilot, right? Down that road, that drone pilot that's been trained by the US might come back and go to command and staff college in the United States. You build these enduring relationships um, and are able to kind of influence how, how the military operates down the road. So we, we've seen, I think, a, a loosening of US military drone restriction or export restrictions, and we've seen the export of these systems to other countries that we previously were not exporting to, just to to make sure that the Chinese and, and other actors don't necessarily uh, have, a, have a monopoly on that market, right? We've seen several close US allies, so Saudi Arabia, Jordan, um, and so on are all flying Chinese drones, largely because the MTCR uh, prohibited us from selling these systems. Uh, on the commercial side of the house, I think it's much more difficult, right? I can buy these things uh, off of Amazon for $1,000 and I can get them sent really anywhere and I can take them to the battlefield. Uh, so I think that poses a, a trickier you know, policy, policy uh, challenge. Well, I will say limited things on this because I'm sitting between two prolifer pro proliferation experts and uh, maybe I'm gonna preempt what you're gonna say, but I'm, I'm, I, I thought a lot about um, some of your earlier work where there's differences across regime types in the incentives to use, uh, use this technology. And I w um, I'll be interested to see how in the future as, the dr as drones proliferate, how public opinion responds in different ways across regime types. Is it similar mm -hmm. in democracies and autocracies or not? So when I first came at this question at, of proliferation, uh, it, was, it was many years ago, uh, and my priors were the US, where I had written a lot on this moral hazard problem. And so I had a kind of past as prologue concern, which is, look, the US has done this. They've, you, they've done more than whatever. Now it's probably 600 counterterrorism counter strikes. Any country that is using this technology is going to use it in the same way. Uh, but it turns out that that, uh, that sort of argument really kind of gets shattered under closer scrutiny. And I think part of the reason, there's, there are a lot of reasons for it, and, and Eric, I think, spoke to this to some degree, is the whole like apparatus of, I think we think of a drone, I think it was easy to think about a drone as just like, you buy this Amazon uh, technology, kind of the, and, and then you can just take it and do global strikes. You cannot do that. <laughs> like a Reaper needs an entire apparatus of forward operating ba uh, bases, um, SATCOM linkages. They have the Nellis part, the uh, overseas part, the African part. I mean, and, and so I have this uh, map I show of US bases, drone bases in the Middle East and Africa, and the radius of a drone. And so what I think this illustrates is, the, is the, the global scope that is afforded to the US and conversely the, the lack of scope and lack of reach of any other country. Uh, China has started a base in Djibouti, um, so that will give it some competitive, <laughs> I guess, reach. Um, but that's still not, I mean, that's sort of a, a that's still a regional kind of footprint. Um, and when I looked, so, th so I think there's a, la a limit to the sort of global reach of countries that acquire this technology. But I also, because of that, uh, but I also kind of looking at cases like Pakistan, like Nigeria, that acquire these Chinese drones, 
it wasn't as though they suddenly were engaging in the use of force where they hadn't been already. That it was clear in looking at those countries that these armed drones just became another kind of uh, tool in its arsenal rather than uh, creating a moral hazard that was causing these countries to use force where they weren't. And so I think, and that's something, a distinction that Mike Horowitz, Matt Furman, and I make in our uh, international security piece, that these intrastate conflicts are a different dynamic, that in, in most of these cases, countries are looking for kind of new tools for an ongoing conflict, that it's not causing them to now suddenly use force. So I think these dynamics are very different from the US in a, in a number of ways that I guess I tend not to be an optimist on questions of international regional security, but I sort of am on this question. Or I'm less pessimistic. Very good, thank you. All right, without any further ado, I'm gonna open up the floor for questions from the audience. <laughs> We have a microphone on both sides, which are staffed by our graduate students volunteer. So if you could step up to the microphone, introduce yourself, your affiliation, ask your question. Take the plate. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was uh, extremely insightful. Um, my question on drones uh, is that um, seemingly we've been very reactive uh, to understanding drones instead of being proactive, which I think is been uh, something in the security field since, um, you know, for many decades. Um, recently, um, as recent as early 2018, the U.S. government and in cooperation with the U.K. government uh, dispatched uh, a number of drone experts to uh, certain areas in the Middle East and North Africa. It's a $700 million program uh, for a, a drone shoot down exercise, which I think is, a, is an immense amount of money to spend on uh, something that could potentially have um, not as many casualties, or maybe the threat doesn't seem to be that huge. Um, do you think this is based on the potential threat, or is it just the perception of it? Uh, because you know, just looking at places like New York City, Boston, San Francisco, and other places where they have certain security measures there, maybe um, signal jamming, um, but n nowhere near that amount of money has been spent on um, something as proactive as this? Does this speak to the level of the threat that we're anticipating in the future, or is it just the perception that it's something we can't control, so we're dispatching all of these kind of drone shooting experts? Thanks. I hope, I hope my question was clear. Yeah, so I think uh, from, from kind of a, the anti-terrorism standpoint, I think it's a different type of threat that costs a lot of money, right? If I want to stop a truck bomb, I can take really cheap concrete barriers and, and put them around Times Square to stop a truck bomb, right? Um, I, solutions to, to kind of a drone problem is, is a bit pricier to figure out, right? And, and so that's why I think we, we see a lot of money being dedicated to this. And it's also, I think, a vexing policy challenge, right? I can't jam all signals in Times Square, right? That would just be incredibly problematic. So I think there needs to be R&D work that's being done. That's why you see really creative solutions, like the French using falcons to go snatch drones out of the, the sky uh, in an attempt to find these things. But I think getting there uh, takes a lot of effort, especially because these commercial off-the-shelf drones mm -hmm. that you can strap an explosive onto are really, really cheap. Um, and unfortunately, there's this you know, imbalance of, of what you're spending to defend. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of um, concern about this question, and maybe this is in part an effort to kind of get ahead of the curve, right? So before the threat really materializes in a major way, uh, to sort of experiment with some of these technologies. Using concrete barriers kind of reminds me that when concrete barriers were sort of first introduced, or that's a technology that's sort of, a, it's a basic technology, but it's evolved, right? From, you know, walls to now these like fancy sort of planters you see outside buildings with, that are enormous with a small plant in the middle. Uh, so. Um, uh, maybe this is in part an effort to sort of um, experiment with different solutions and see which ones work and which ones are worthy of future development. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a good question, but it was funny because when you said m uh, million with an M, I, I thought, well, I mean, that's barely anything. You know, and, and <laughs> one billion, I should say nearly one billion. Nearly one billion. I mean, a billion here, a billion there, and it starts adding up to real money. I mean, I think for Pentagon money, that's. Uh, not that significant, and especially compared to uh, how much the U.S. spent. I mean, it stood up an entire counter IED uh, organization that was, I mean, literally billions of dollars over many years. Um, and I think it gets at, though, some of these questions of how do you recalibrate perceptions of threat, and whether that question you ask about whether it's a real threat or a perceived threat is a, a, a distinction without a difference, in the sense that if if 
people, like, can you, can you disavow people of the, the, the percentage likelihood that they're going to be sniped when they're filling their gas tank? Like, that doesn't seem to matter to most people. They, like, your percentage of dying um, by being killed by, um, while taking a bath is greater than your likelihood of being killed by a terrorist attack. Those things are all psychology, and they don't seem to resonate with people. And so then I think it comes back to kind of these questions of democratic <laughs> incentives, which is that leaders then kind of feel compelled to be seen kind of addressing the, this problem, even if they don't think it's you know, a real problem statistically, that if then something happens, they can, it's a CYA exercise. They can say, well, look, we spent $700 million on this, this project in the Middle East and Africa, prepping people to shoot these things down. There was nothing we could do. We spent all this money, the, ergo, like, we are, we are taking this threat seriously. Yeah, um, yeah. Hello. I can speak loudly. <laughs> uh, I'll just use my, uh, Parade ground voice. Uh, I'm Dan Kazita. I'm a security consultant for London. Um, is really the drone threat more, really, pragmatically, an economic threat these days? We, we saw the we saw the basically air, area and airspace denial at Gatwick Airport over what may or may not have actually been an actual drone. It's still up for debate whether it actually was a drone, uh, despite various witness accounts. Um, I mean, is that really statistically far more significant than you know, the theoretical capability to drop coffee cup sized bits of ordnance off of uh, Amazon? I mean, is that, isn't that really, really much more important, I think? The idea that even just the rumor of a drug causes millions and you know, gradually over time it happens a lot of billions of that and then it's trading the economy. I think, I think that's right, but I think at the same time, the cup size attack in Times Square potentially has economic consequences as well, right? So shaping behavior of potential tourists and, and things of that nature. So I think you're right. I think any attack has, has both economic consequences and potentially you know, kinetic ones as well. Yeah, and psychological yeah. ones as well. Uh, psychological ones as well, right? So an attack like that, that would um, yeah, maybe change people's behavior in a more fundamental way than sort of strictly economic capitalists would suggest. All right, so uh, I'm sure all of you know the occup occupational hazard of studying security is that people will ask you like your armchair view of a huge array of security issues. So after this Gatwick, uh, Gatwick gate, uh, I had half a dozen people say, well, tell me what's going on, what, what's the Gatwick situation, you know? And, I, and, and so it's an interesting question and I think it gets at sort of the fundamental like self-interested, egotistical nature of most people. They wanna know, if I'm scheduled to fly, can I do that on the day I'm scheduled to fly or am I going to be <laughs> held up for several days, which it was a, a number of days um, that people's uh, travel plans were disrupted. And so I, I, I agree that I think in some, and I think this gets it, I was thinking about the case of the, uh, and we have experts, or people who are far more expert at this question than I am on the, uh, kind of the knock on effects of the Boston Marathon bombing. Did it affect people's day to day? And I wonder whether people are, this has become so normalized that, and maybe gets a little bit of these experiments too, which is like, okay, so we have these, these incidents all the time. Um, and what, you know, you just go back to your normal life. Well, here's something where you can't go back to your normal life because now you can't, you know, go to the Maldives if you're like go ahead, trying to go on holiday from the UK and see some sun. So I, I agree, but the question is sort of how does, how do we wrangle that? So, uh, and, and maybe this gets back to this other question about spending a lot of money to deal with this problem is that that 700 million then stops to sound like I didn't think it was a lot of money to begin with, but it's even less money by comparison to the amount of the, ec the economic disruption that happened just in this week at Gatwick. Over here. Gary Ackman from the University at Albany. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, all three panelists. That was really interesting talk and some really great work that you're doing. Um, just one comment on, on something that I'm doing which may or may not be relevant, and then one suggestion for Eric as, as you move forward. So one of the, com the comments is that I'm actually trying to look at, do a, a full threat assessment or risk assessment um, computationally of 
a jihadist uh, launched uh, significant drone attack in the US and significant we say you know causes kills more than a dozen people because for political and other reasons that would be significant um, it turns out so far, and it's a rudimentary model, so we're still adding a lot more of the variables in, but so far there, we've got a 90% chance of failure. So we were surprised that the chance of success, if you look at the entire threat chain from gaining expertise, gaining the equipment, uh, testing, getting your algorithms right, getting everything right, evading countermeasures, um, there's a lot of things where you can slip up and you can come to the attention of authorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't know. In a, in a month's time, I might have a completely different answer, but so far, that's at least a little heartening to me that there's a 90% failure rate. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to try it and might get lucky. Um, the other thing is, Eric, it's, it's one of the things that I uh, often think about is you said, yes, the media framing is important, but I think also the, the terrorist group themselves, their framing is important because they are actually going to, you know, even if the media doesn't cover it, if they put out a whole lot of celebratory videos by showing how easy it is to kill people with the drone, that might uh, affect the perceptions. Um, uh, one of the things I always found funny was then when ISIS started with their drones and they were quite rinky-dink and, you know, essentially not good-looking they were ugly drones. In their videos where they showed them flying the drone, they took one of those nice fixed wing drones that was nicely painted and they showed them launching it. And then they cut to the thing of them dropping an ordnance. But the drone that dropped the ordnance was an ugly looking quadcopter. But they realized that if they showed, people are going to assume that that nice looking fancy fixed wing drone, which is essentially just a model, uh, couldn't really do anything. That was what, so, so it was definitely to, to, to sort of signal their status and sophistication. Um, so I, one thing is that I, I would also take into account, you could also vary in your, in your experiment perhaps, um, you know, have a vignette that later that day the terrorist group publishes widely on YouTube, uh, you know, that they, they now have the capability to launch drones anywhere and everywhere and, you know, that kind of thing and see if that affects any of the perceptions. Perfect, uh, thank you. That, just a suggestion. Thanks. All right, so we'll, we'll sort out that mic and then we'll come back to you in, in a moment if that's okay. Well, just keep it. Or unless you, you want to use. Yeah, I'll just say it. Sounds good. I'm a student at Georgia Tech and I'm, uh, I deal with the actual uh, ME and CSE. So I'm closer to the design of the site. Um, could you guys for a moment speak to which, like, the future operating environment? There's, there are a host of technological limitations and environmental limitations to an effective use of drones as a, as a kinetic killing platform. So you guys kind of, the reason why the, the Reaper has all of that huge technological infrastructure are for a host of reasons that don't always work all the time. So you need a huge infrastructure to, mm -hmm. to supply that so that it can have more utility value. So as you look into the future, how do you know that this is just perhaps maybe a distraction to invest huge amounts of resources? Meanwhile, there are myriad of other way more effective ways. I've seen this here where because the Ukrainians and the Russians did a cyber attack uh, on the utility sector when they, when they did an invasion, huge amounts of resources go, go into, hey, they're going to do this, they're going to do this again. And that's not how actual war works. It's highly contingent on surprise. So, uh, you know, it just seems like each time maybe perhaps an experiment is taking place because in the military, real experiments, real reconnaissance, value over strategic thought, they can just be doing a series of experiments. And, oh, this is the limits of it, and move on to something else. And that's why I was kind of wondering. I don't really see any pushback from like actual operators in the field. So. Yeah, so I think um, if we look at the ISIS use case, I think there was some kind of organizational learning as ISIS realized that the United States w was actually jamming their remote control systems. They, they moved to having essentially autonomous pre-programmed flights, so they would kind of pre-program that in. Uh, one of the, I was at a conference last week, and one of the concerns was, well, perhaps I have these Wi-Fi control drones where I can leave a drone in the back of the room, leave the room, 
and then fly via Wi-Fi and have it dispense something over here. So I think there is some, some degree of kind of learning in these groups of saying, okay, we understand that uh, the adversary is developing countermeasures and then you know, they are in turn developing counter-countermeasures. I don't know if that fully gets at, at your question. Um. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's an excellent question and it gets at, I think, directly or indirectly at uh, what I think often happens in these uh, kinds of acquisition environments, um, kind of the prisoner's dilemma problem, where you end up in the Cold War with this situation of overkill, where the US and USSR have produced far more weapons than it would take to kill each other many times over. And it's this kind of like the escalatory thing of like, oh, well, they have this, we better have this. Okay, if they have this, we better get this. And before you know it, you're at 60,000 warheads. And, and, and I think that some of this is going on in the uh, development of drones as well. And some of this may have military utility. So as you were suggesting, one of the big, lim there are many limitations of the current generation drones. So a former Air Force general, Mike Hossage, said that they're useless in contested airspace, uh, which means that they fly low and slow. They're like, you know, they're easy to shoot down. Um, and so what are they doing? Well, they're developing stealthier ones and faster ones, ones that look like, I, you know, my favorite was the SR-71. I love this airplane. They're coming up with the, it looks like Lockheed is coming up with the SR-72, which is going to be an unmanned uh, equivalent, which is faster, stealthier, um, and better able to evade air defenses. And so it, it does seem like a sort of case of technological determinism, where, well, we, we currently have this technological limitation. We're going to overcome it. <laughs> and so I think then it leads to this outcome that, that we were just talking about. Yeah, I'll just say one thing, which is that um, you know you, you mentioned cyber, and what maybe is an interesting comparison there is is that that's a, a domain where you can have effects with a relatively small investment, right, um, uh, in expertise and personnel, and it'll be interesting to see if especially the non-state actors are able to ramp up the sort of capabilities of of drones, which we're talking about here, uh, but do so in a way that maybe doesn't require like all the infrastructure that you developed in terms of like the satellite uplinks and uh, things like that. Adam Stolber here at uh, the Sam Nunn School. I was just wondering if each one of you could comment a little bit from your respective research perspectives on what are the implications if you vary the terrorism group type? Uh, in other words, do you see any variation between the rates of acquisition or diffusion of these uh, technologies to different types of terrorist groups? Do you see different effects in terms of the hard versus soft target al a focus of different terrorist group organizations? And do you see any response in the American public about uh, if it's a terrorist strike by a Hamas versus, or a drone strike by a Hamas versus a different type of organization, jihadist uh, or other type of? Uh, extremist group. So, so I, I mean, um, I'm hoping to do that in the next stage of kind of the experimental research design, but I think if you look at, at the Israeli case, they face, uh, they face drones being flown by both kind of Hezbollah, uh, which are, are far more advanced than those being flown by, by Hamas, and the Israeli response has been quite different in each of those cases. Uh, when Hamas is flying kind of these small quadcopters around, they're using uh, kind of relatively low-tech jamming equipment, or they're just shooting them down. Um, by infantry troops on the ground. When you have a Hezbollah drone that, that penetrates close to, you know, Demona, right, so, so the, the nuclear, nuclear reactor, you see a much, much broader uh, type of response. So I think that's a long way of getting at the question, saying all of these groups that are using these have different objectives. Uh, so Hamas is trying to drop something on a, on a small village, whereas Hezbollah is trying to make a much more strategic signal uh, of their ability to, to hit strategic targets or to reach strategic targets. And I think that drives the response um, by state actors. Yeah, one thing I would say about that is, is that different um, uh, non-state violent actors have different sort of strategies of violence, right? So we could think about it, one extreme would be a group that is like sort of a purely terrorist group, you know, they want to create terror, and for them, maybe using a, a sort of small off-the-shelf drone in a, in a populated area um, uh, would have a big psychological effect. Um, and would be, you know, relatively easy to do. Uh, 
but lots of other militant groups are basically sort of like conventional combatants, right? If we think about like Hezbollah or uh, Islamic State in Mosul, right? So they're, what's interesting there is, is that their strategy of integrating, or they, they really maybe have a strategy of integrating this technology with their other military capabilities, right? So instead of using it to create um, mass sort of psychological effects, they really want to use it to increase their conventional and other forms of military power, right? So using it for uh, surveillance, maybe for using it for launching remote attacks and like that. So you could see a, quite a diverse sort of set of strategies for integrating the technology into their, uh, into their object, meeting their objectives. Uh, so this isn't something I've necessarily studied closely. So is a bit of a conjecture, but I would imagine that there's a connection between the uh, degree of state sponsorship and the sophistication of these drones, just kind of intuitively, and that this would have a pretty significant effect. You, you had shown a picture of the Hezbollah, uh, kind of Iranian-provided, produced uh, drone um, compared to some of the ones uh, that are less sophisticated, to use your variable. Um, and, and so I think this would certainly play a role in why, for example, the ISIS drones uh, looked like they were duct taped together because they don't have the same degree of state sponsorship. Hi, I'm Erica Briscoe here at Georgia Tech Research Institute. And this question is mainly for Eric, and I'm kind of stealing some of my own thunder from the AI panel later today. But I'm, my question is whether you have looked at uh, the difference in perceptions of drones um, if they have more or less agency. That is, do people perceive differently when they're autonomous or they're sentient as opposed to being uh, remotely operated? Uh, I, I have not in, in this kind of particular project, but in broader work, um, I've looked at kind of the, the intelligence backbone of the U.S. Uh, drone, drone program. That's kind of where I was before I, I started uh, this whole academia business. Um, and I think people often overlook it, um, but I don't know how much that actually shapes, and you probably can speak to this more, more than I can, but I don't know how, how much that actually shapes uh, kind of opinions of, of blame and, and things of that nature. I think it just, uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier, makes people think that it's a lot easier to do things when they overlook this huge backbone um, that's involved. Yeah, so I, I can speak to that briefly. Uh, so I have one paper that looks at autonomous systems and responsibility attribution. And I think that's really a fundamental issue, right? Because with these autonomous systems to various degrees, we're outsourcing decision making to, a, to basically a computer, right? And also it's, it's, not a, it's an autonomous system, it's not an automated system, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, presumably the system has a capability to learn from its environment and make decisions that are sort of difficult for a human being to unpack, except maybe in retrospect. Certainly difficult to predict. So um, I did do one survey where we looked at responsibility attribution for uh, like military attacks that have produced undesirable consequences. I think it was civilian casualties in this case. And the, 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 the concern there would be that, well, by outsourcing the decision making, maybe political and military leaders can also outsource the blame, right? Uh, so they can avoid blame by saying, well, we didn't actually make the decision, the machine did. And, and what we found was that uh, that really doesn't happen that people still fundamentally hold the, the top political leaders responsible for the outcomes. Now, what, one caveat to that, too, though, is, is of course, that's a very, uh, and this sort of echoes what you were saying earlier, uh, Sarah, about that's a very hypothetical scenario, right? So we haven't actually seen those systems mm -hmm. deployed or have those effects yet. So it'd be interesting to see what happens if and when that does occur. That is true. Uh, it does seem as though the studies I've seen on this suggest a lot of public antipathy toward full autonomy. You know, that, the, that a machine is going to make a decision about a lethal strike. Um, and I think, but I, but I also think that that ties to, we were talking I was, uh, at dinner last, last night um, about the uh, kind of automation, the driverless cars, you know, and this one incident in Arizona that by all accounts, and in fact, there was a, a person in the passenger seat, so it wasn't even fully autonomous, but sort of the degree to which sort of the public perception of that uh, then kind of put the brakes, I'm like, my puns are terrible today, put the brakes on the, the development of these driverless vehicles uh, for, for at least some time because of this, Again, the psychology uh, that people have about full autonomy. And it, it makes me think also about, um, which will probably come up later, about Project Maven, 
and you know Google feeling this pressure to pull back from this. And if you think about what that project uh, was doing, you know, it's taking these terabytes of uh, imagery from from drones and basically trying to create these training sets of kind of what a combatant is and what a civilian is, and then kind of feed this into some kind of autonomy. Um, and I think that starts to, to, to feel more like you are playing God in terms of like deciding who the civilian is and who uh, the combatant is in ways that uh, go against, as we were saying earlier about, it, is, is I think which I think it has jettisoned its don't be evil, but sort of that's still that mantra of like, well, we shouldn't be evil and be in the business of doing something that might then feed into a lethal decision. So, so it's interesting yeah. though, right? So, so the Israelis have this autonomous vehicle that they use to patrol uh, kind of this no man's land between Gaza and the rest of Israel. And the vehicle itself can be entirely autonomous and including the firing system. When you talk to kind of Israeli military officers, they have this A, strong kind of normative belief that that decision to pull the trigger should be made by an infantry guy, not, not a, a random mm -hmm. you know, operator, but it should be an infantry guy who presses mm -hmm. the button to shoot. Um, and so there's this, I think, bureaucratic and, and kind of normative reason uh, that we might not necessarily see full autonomy, even though we have, right? So CWIS, Close and Weapon System on Naval Ships, is fully autonomous and it can engage uh, any kind of target. So it's kind of this weird, you know, I think cultural thing uh, that I'm not sure I have a good explanation for. Yeah, I could say one more thing about that is, is that it seems like for the um, organizations that are developing autonomous systems, whether they be military or not, it's a really sort of dangerous time because um, the public doesn't have concrete expectations or beliefs about this. And, you know, rather small developments like accidents uh, could really fundamentally shape how people think about the technology in the future and influence public policy regulation of it. I think in particular of like civilian nuclear power, right, which in the, you know, 1950s and 60s was seen as basically a way to generate electricity for free, had no real downside. Um, and then, of course, that changes after accidents in a really fundamental way. And we haven't seen the construction, successful construction of nuclear power plants in the US since... Um, Three Mile Island. Yeah, since Three Mile Island, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to follow up on, uh, sorry, Mia Bloom, Georgia State University. I wanted to follow up on the point that Sarah was making and also to draw from the pun. So of course, what did we call our conference today, T2? I think a lot of this concern over uh, full, automa full automation is this sort of uh, the threat of Skynet, you know, the idea that once the machines are making independent calculations about targeting, then things are gonna run amok. But I was just curious, um, as far as the technologies that you guys have studied with drones, is it just easy enough for the Israelis to like do an EMP disruption blast and then that's it? Or is it less likely because there's civilian uh, air flights, there's, air, you know, there's um, aviation in the skies? Like, I'm just wondering if that the mitigation strategy against drones being used by terrorists is as easy as a pulse. Hmm. Well, it does seem like that would be a pretty indiscriminate response, right? It could have lots of consequences for civilian lives. So maybe that would be a constraint on using that as a, as a tactic to counter it. And I mean, the, the same type of attack that's being used against your adversary systems is probably going to limit your own ability to operate systems that you would want to have operating to, to collect on, on the organizations that you'd be targeting. Hmm. No, I do think that your mileage varies on this stuff. That, um, and, and the domestic political climate and the sense of security stakes and the threat will constrain um, some of these, these countermeasures as well. And, you, and, and so, you know, it would be interesting too to see whether this, whether you get, for example, different outcomes if you studied the Israeli public, for example, compared to the US public. Yeah. Did you have a question? Um, yes. I was half in the middle of formulating. Anyway, Larry Rubin, uh, Georgia Tech. Um, I was thinking about uh, kind of two related questions. Um, have, have we seen non-state actors uh, maybe attempting or 
trying to acquire more sophisticated um, drones and more of a military scale rather than just the commercial one. And what do you think in terms of their um, their trade off? The the one it seems like pretty low tech to be able to um, to develop or buy an Amazon, but um, investing more more capabilities into that to be able to, the drones to do more. Seeing it in a sense of saying they're, they've got to expend some resources to do this type of thing. Do you, do you see this as kind of a, an, an area? Or what, what's your research been in that way? So I think when you see st uh, non-state actors kind of acquiring more state-like drone capabilities, it makes them a lot easier to target and to hold sure. very expensive things at risk, right? If I want to go you know, blow up a house because I think a guy is storing 20 you know, cheap drones in the basement, at the end of the day, a, that's difficult to find, and B, it's not generating a huge amount of damage to, to the terrorist organization. If you look at, at Hezbollah, which is flying these large drones, and this gets back to what Sarah was talking about, it's not just the aircraft. Uh, it includes a, a command van as well. And so if we think back to almost exactly a year ago, um, the Israelis launched an airstrike on, uh, on a Iranian-operated drone. So this was an Iranian drone, but one can imagine that it was a Hezbollah drone. Um, and the Israelis made the determination that shooting down the drone itself was not enough. Um, it, in order to target the entire drone system, you needed to target this command van, which happened to be located in Syria. Uh, so the Israeli Air Force went and blew this thing up, and they claimed publicly that they didn't realize that there was a senior uh, Iranian official in, inside this command van who they killed as well. So you have these interesting uh, dynamics where you use these larger things, they're easier to, to target from, you know, for dealing with a, a state military, um, but you also have kind of interesting questions about inadvertent escalation that can potentially play out. I guess I also wonder about sort of, you know, if you, th it seems in some ways weird to think about military utility in the context of non-state <laughs> actors, except they have, they think about that, military utility, and, and you can imagine that they could derive sufficient military utility out of a relatively cheap Amazon drone that they strap a grenade onto. In other words, if, so their goals are not the same as state goals necessarily either. And so you, if you think about sort of strategy is like you identify your ends and then figure out the means that you need to get there. Their ends, I think, are somewhat different. They're not trying to do global strikes in the same way. They're not trying to kill large quantities. I mean, they sort of are and they aren't, but I think they can derive, a, like if you think about their payoff, they can derive a decent amount of value, uh, military utility from killing two people on a battlefield, which is actually that ISIS strike in uh, the Kurdish part of Iraq uh, had a pretty significant impact in, in just, they killed two Kurdish soldiers and I think injured two French soldiers. Um, and this was clearly kind of, uh, again, this effect of demonstrating that they could do this on a battlefield. And it didn't, I don't think the value added to them would have been any greater to kill you know five people than two people. Uh, and so I think they can kind of, again, cost benefit. They don't need to spend um, tens of thousands of dollars. They can spend a few hundred or a couple thousand and get these kind of consequences that they're going for. At the same time, though, I think uh, kind of a, a group like Hezbollah derives a, a lot of strategic value by developing you know, military-grade drones, mm -hmm. right? So after this 2012 flight, uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah came out and made this huge public you know, statement saying, hey, look, we can hold your most critical you know, resources at risk, uh, so we're actually a viable organization. So it gets back to this notion of status, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. Hey there. Uh, Emerson Brooking, Atlantic Council. Uh, so it seems evident from this discussion that the first terrorist group to use even a primitive drone would get a big recruiting dividend because of the appearance of technological sophistication without much investment. Um, and Eric, you alluded specifically to uh, trying to command that information space and shape that narrative afterward to downplay mm -hmm. that perception of technological sophistication. <coughs> but I'm, I'm wondering if we could just think through what a US government communication strategy should look like in the aftermath of one of these first attacks. Because it seems if you downplay the sophistication of this method, you might be sparking a public panic in a different way because then it becomes apparent, our vulnerabilities become more apparent than they already are. Sure. So I think kind of the, the narrative is getting back to, to one of Gary's comments from earlier, right, where ISIS will show this very advanced drone 
uh, taking off, but that's not actually the drone that's carrying out the, the narrative. So I think it's, it's actually trying to come back with a facts-based approach and saying, hey, the drone that carried this out was, was a relatively low-tech drone. I, I think your point, though, uh, that you bring up is, is an incredibly valid one, and I'm not sure how, how the government structures a response to, to kind of both downplay the potential threat to, to make the group look not nearly as sophisticated as they are, while at the same time not kind of driving uh, the outcomes that you, you discuss. I don't know if you, mm -hmm. either of you have. Sure, just briefly, I wonder if like the $700 million investment is really one of um, shifting blame or, mm -hmm. or reducing blame uh, for the government, right? They could say, if an attack like this occurred, uh, they could say, well, we weren't totally unprepared, right? We have been spending money and time and effort to try to mitigate this threat. Um, and maybe if it's not, maybe it's not successful, but maybe that would also reduce the, the blame that the government gets for being entirely unprepared. Mm -hmm. No, I know that this is something that uh, the now former DHS secretary added to her list of uh, threats for last year when she uh, briefed the Hill on what are the really pressing homeland security threats. Um, and so, you know, I think there is a there is a cottage industry of both the threat inflators and the counter threat inflators uh, on the national security questions. Um, and so, I think the counter threat inflators would look at this this as a so-called threat, you know, just in the sense that, well, th this, is not a, this is not a weapon of mass destruction. Um, but again, I, can, I think it comes back to both the psychology of threat and, um, and the, the democratic politics of being seen addressing these so-called threats. Thank you. All right, we have time for one more question. <laughs> no, 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 okay. I don't need it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Jenna Jordan from Georgia Tech. So I, have, I think there's this interesting dynamic that came up in all the talks about this sort of, you know, on, on, on the one hand, the, pub, the, the terrorist groups want to be perceived as strong. You know, they want to be perceived as having status and not having been weakened if they've undergone strikes. But at the, there's also this dynamic of understanding, like, how the public perceives organizations that have these kinds of capabilities. So, you know, Eric's research, um, which I think was so interesting. And so I'm wondering if it's really just about um, is it about the capabilities that the organizations have, or is it like, you know, in Jim's research, looking at the kind of distinction between the targets that the groups are actually, you know, targeting, whether it's like soft targets, more terrorist attacks, or whether, you know, hitting more hardened kind of targets with insurgent attacks. And so what the public really cares about, I mean, are they sort of more interested in the capabilities of the organizations, or are they more interested in the actual sorts of attacks that organizations are carrying out? And so kind of getting at that public dimension, I think a little bit more, is something I'm, I'm really interested in. So I was thinking, actually, with the previous question about uh, some of the conversations I'd had with Dan Byman, who works on terrorism quite a bit. and. Uh, this had been in my, my sort of pinnacle of uh, frenzy about the risks of proliferation. He said, why, why are you worried about you know, drone proliferation? You know, there are far more capacious uh, weapons to use than a drone. Uh, and so he pointed to you know, Hezbollah rockets. Like, why would you ever, his point is like, why would you ever use a drone if you could use a much more effective rocket, Katusha rocket, or whatever. Um, and, and I think that's a valid point. And, but it, it, it does sort of divorce the question of capabilities from the perception. And I don't think you can entirely do that, because I think the perception of these things is important. But then you can imagine kind of a, a scenario for a, a, a terrorist group where you can continue to use the capacious thing while grafting on the signaling of we're a sophisticated organization because we have these drones. And there, there, there's your toolkit right there. So I don't think you can, I don't think, I don't think one has to kind of zero sum this, zero sum this. I think that these kind of can be complementary. All right. So let's thank this fantastic panel which i think really sets the mood for what's going to be a fantastic uh rest of the conference so thank you very much for your for your time and your astute comments uh we're going to break for for tea and coffee in 
the lobby uh, and we'll reconvene at 11.15. Just a quick reminder from our host at GTRI, there's no food inside the auditorium, so if you could leave the food on the other side of uh, the wall, that would be much appreciated. As well, drinks need to have lids uh, within the auditorium. Thank you very much and we'll reconvene in 20 minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you.